Um, everybody, welcome to the anniversary edition of Happy Hour Plus um, Living History Series. We are so glad and so thrilled to have with us for the first talk, Jay Zhao from JHU. Without further ado, please tell us about living breathtaking history. All right. Um, thank you, Shri, uh, Shri and uh, Orit for the invitation. When I told my daughter yesterday that I'm going to give this living history talk, and she looked at me, she said, mom, you're a history already? Um, so I was thinking about, you know, maybe it's not just become part, be, become history, but really become part of the history and really leave the history. I thought that's what this is about. And I thought this is such a great opportunity that you all put this together, even though in the middle of the pandemic, you can't really travel. But when this virtual meeting, you really get to see a lot of people that you usually don't get a chance to see. So thank you for doing this. Um, so I will start tell you my story. So this is really more like a conversation to tell you um, how I get to uh, where I am right now. So I, um, I grew up in China, uh, Chongqing. So if you can see, this is really the map of China. Um, this city called Chongqing, it's called a mountain city. The whole city is really built on top of mountains. And if I zoom in this little area, you can see that we have the Yangtze River uh, going through the city. This is the big metropolitan area. And my hometown, I really grew up in this little uh, a little village or little town, a ship factory uh, in the suburban of the big city. Um, the city nowadays is really big. It's one of those four autonomous city uh, district in China. I think if you include all the surrounding areas, have about 30 million population. And this is one of the pictures I took uh, of a couple of years ago. It's a night uh, scene of the city along the Yangtze River Bank. It's, uh, it's really a big um, metropolitan area, but then, you know, during the day, the city is really breathtakingly beautiful. Um, I love the city. I grew up over there. I am very familiar with all the scenes and house, especially that those uh, um, up and downs, those uh, hills. If you look at the, all the skyscrapers, you think, God, they're so high and your hat going to fall if you look at them. But we be reminded that most of those skyscrapers are really built on top of the hills so that the hill really adds onto uh, a great, um, a great height to those buildings. And because the city is really built on hills and mountains, I never learned how to ride bicycle when I was uh, growing up over there. I only learned how to ride a bicycle when I went to my college city, Nanjing. Uh, but then the city is also very famous for its cuisine, Sichuan cuisine. I don't know if many of you have tried the hapat of Chongqing is one of the favorite cuisine that uh, local people enjoy. I think now, nowadays, if you go to many Chinese restaurants, especially for Sichuan, or Chongqing restaurant, uh, you're going to uh, encounter it. It's, it's such a feast whenever you get together with your friends. Um, but what really made uh, me, you know, taking this route I'm doing right now is my high school, uh, Chongqing Yichong. Literally, it is called Chongqing number one high school. It does not mean it's ranked number one. Well, I mean, they are going to argue with you. It is actually probably one of the best high schools in the city. But at that time in China, the high schools are always named number one, number two, number three, not necessarily because they're ranked in terms of their education quality, uh, but just you know ranked in, uh, uh, named in such a way. And that high school is a boarding school. So I went there for my high school and uh, I was really immersed in, I mean, they give very rigorous training and especially for my high school chemistry teacher. I still remember her. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Miss Hua Fang Li. Um, she really challenged me uh, during high school chemistry classes. Uh, she even took me, uh, I remember on occasions, go to the university, Chongqing University, which is right next door to our high school to do some experiment. At that time, I mean, that was like in the 1980s. Uh, and in China, it's just so hard for any high school kid to go into university to do a little experiment. To me, that was, you know, like, like the outer you would ultimately want to go into. And I also remember she, she said when I was about to graduate and she said, she said, Jay, um, 
you should not stay in the city. You should really go out, you know, leave home, go far away places, try to find something new to work on. So I think with her encouragement, then I went to a city called Nanjing in China, about 2,000 miles down of the Yangtze River for my college. And you can see I marked the Yangtze River or called Changjiang. At that time, it's really hard to travel in China. Um, I went to college in 1991. Uh, airline tickets, extremely expensive. I could not afford it. Uh, trains going to take, you have to go around the, because it's a mountain city, you have to really go around from the north or from the south and it takes 48 hours on the train. Uh, so what we usually do is actually take a cruise uh, ship going from our city, because it's a port city, all the way to Nanjing. And that's, you, you get to view the beautiful three gorges of, of the Yangtze River. And if any one of you have a chance to do that, I really highly encourage you to go, even though we have the uh, uh, Yangtze River down right now, uh, but the, the, the scenery is still breathtaking. Um, so then I went to Nanjing for my college. Uh, I couldn't find any pictures when I was in college, but I found this one picture that's it's like a class reunion after 20 years after we graduated. And you can see we have young kids at that time already. So I enrolled in a biochemistry department and that's where I really got hooked on in biology and chemistry. And I thought, you know, natural science, I mean, there are some rules over there, and it doesn't really change depends on how you think about it. And the, what your job is really to find out what those rules are. And to me, that has this uh, intrinsic beauty to doing science. Um, then after I graduated from Nanjing University, I uh, again, upon the encouragement of my college teachers, professors, and my high school uh, chemistry teacher, Miss Lee, I went from Nanjing to Houston, Texas. Uh, it's it's you know the first you know uh, international trip I ever taken. Uh, it's actually also probably my first time uh, uh, riding on an airplane to Houston, and I enrolled in Rice University. Um, it's, it's really a beautiful uh, school, very small, um, but very intimate. The relationship between students and professors are very close. Um, then at that time, I worked in uh, Dr. Scott Singleton's lab. He is a chemist. And he, I think I, I'm so grateful at that time. You know, he took me in. I think I probably showed some raw potential for doing research and he took him, but I was so bad at my writing, at my English. You know, when I moved a couple of years ago, I stumped upon a couple of my papers, you know, the seminar papers, research summary. I looked at it, I said, God, my English was like a first grade <laughs> English, it was terrible. So I was grateful that they let me in and I really doing research over there. And, and I, what I worked on, oh, the department was a uh, department about chemistry and cell biology, but then now changed to biosciences. Um, there I worked on this uh, RIC A mediated homologous recombination. And this is my first major research paper with Scott. And there we use the FRAT, you know, fluorescence resonance energy transfer to measure the DNA confirmation change upon RIC A binding and upon the homologous uh, alignment. Uh, this is the type of research really got me hooked down uh, in terms of um, molecular biology and biochemistry. Because I thought, I remember there were some moments when I was doing experiments and when I was moving the floor for on this double strand DNA along and I saw this fret efficiency between two floor for, it shows up this beautifully as what you expected this uh, 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 curve. And I thought, wow, you know, this is really something that just always there and you are only the one trying to figure out how they are actually being put together and what they are trying to do. And, you know, that, that job is incredibly uh, challenging, but also incredibly uh, uh, exciting. I also want to say that at that time, my uh, mentor, Kate uh, Beckingham, and also my thesis committee members, Kathleen uh, Matthews and Yusuf Shemu, they really instilled in me 
is rigorous of doing research. I still remember the time that when I was doing my GBO, the graduate board or examination, I was so nervous and anxious. They really grilled me on the spot and forced me to think on the spot. You know, what does it mean if you are, you know, have a protein bound to DNA? What type of search you're going to do? All sorts of things. Um, also, I did not pass my TPO on the first try. I got a conditional pass and I was devastated because I couldn't answer one question about fluorescence. Uh, but I think that's uh, saying, you know, that's grading on spot also made me realize, you know, you have to stand up. You have to really own your own uh, topic. You have to be the one that uh, know every single little thing in and out if you want to be a great scientist. So after I graduated from uh, Rice University, I decided to change my direction and go to Boston. Um, that is the time that where I transitioned into single molecule biophysics. Um, I remember the reason I went there because at one biophysical society meeting, I was doing a poster presentation about you know, the back chemistry of RAC and DNA. And suddenly, um, at that time, he's uh, at uh, uh, Harvard University Chemistry Department. He stopped by my poster and you know, started talking about my research. And he started talking about his research. And he said something that you know, he wants to look at gene expression in live cells at the single molecule level. And just that one sentence really got me hooked up because I thought, you know, ever uh, since when I was very little, I had this dream like the magical school bus so that you can shrink down to this tiny, tiny, small particle. You can go into the human body, go into the cell and really see how those things are working. And suddenly at that moment, he said he really want to go into the cell, take single molecule e imaging into the lifestyle and really see how those processes happen all the time. So, so I was really excited by that. So I was also lucky enough at that time that he offered me a position at uh, uh, Harvard, but I have never touched a microscope before, except for, you know, lab course. So I really know nothing about single molecule imaging. I have no idea even what is a total internal reflection microscopy. But fortunately, I have very good colleagues, you know, brilliant, brilliant scientists, Dr. Chi Yu, and uh, he's now a professor at the uh, University of uh, Connected Health Center as well. Uh, so he really taught me all of those single molecule biophysics, uh, uh, fluorescence max Crosby, then work, work together and we did a study trying to look at how stochastic gene expression occurs inside uh, living cells. So that was quite exciting at that. And that's one of the first work that we were able to probe those cellular processing live cells. At the same time, when I had my, yeah, am I over time? A uh, couple of minutes, couple of minutes. Okay, okay, I'll just go through it. Then at the, that time, my son was born and this is him right now. You can see time flies. So I, that's a very important year. I got my first scientific child and also my biological child. Then, then I went to um, Hopkins after that. I started my own group. So my group really worked on cell biophysics and all the work we do, you know, it's really thanks to all the students over the years, and many of them want to say hi to you. Um, and our focus is really on different areas that we are trying to develop and use single molecule imaging tools and go into the cell to probe different cellular processes. You know, one direction is on cell division, one is on the organization of transcription and the genome and also stochastic gene expression. So when that, I will stop right here. Um, I just want to show up this one. Imagine we have uh, uh, three different uh, graduate PhD programs. So if any of you have great undergrad students, please do send them our way. Baltimore is a beautiful city. It's nothing like what the uh, mainstream media uh, would broadcast, but it's, it's a lovely city, lots of hiking and uh, biking trails. So with that, I will stop um, and I'll be happy to chat a bit more. Um, thank you so much for that fantastic living history talk, Jay. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, I will jump in first with one. Uh, your high school chemistry teacher story was such a powerful metaphor for opening gates. So I wonder now, 
in your position as professor, what do you think about gatekeeping in academia and how you go about opening gates? Um, I, I do think it's so important to have this opportunity for every kid who want to pursue um, uh, STEM. Uh, I, I do think the teacher's role in this, uh, in this is in, enormous. I, I think nowadays, I mean, I'm a parent of two and both of them are teenagers now. You can clearly see that they usually don't really listen to parents that much, but they listen to their teachers. Um, I, I, I think, I, I think it's absolutely something that we should try as hard as we can and provide all of those opportunities for kids, whoever, you know, want to uh, pursue this way. Um, I'm not particularly, uh, I, I'm not particularly familiar with this open gates uh, uh, policy, but I have heard something, um, you know, different programs are, they're trying to switch different programs uh, that may target a different students' population. And I think it's probably will take a while for people to really see the impact. Thank you so much again. Anybody else? Well, thanks again on behalf of the audience for starting us off with a fantastic Living History talk. Um, I am switching off the recording and we can jump into lively discussion.